so from typhoid and dengue, we come to leptospirosis. Leptospirosis is as common as it, as it gets. Now, if you take any international standard books in, in infectious diseases, including Bennett, or if you look at Goldman and Cecil, or if you, you look at Hardison, their note on leptospirosis is like a very short one, like how we describe Lyme's disease or how we describe a familial Mediterranean fever. It's not seen in those parts of the world. It's pretty much, a, it's pretty much 100%, I would say, a tropical infection. This is like a bread, butter and jam for the treating doctors over here. I think all of you during house agency would have seen numerous, numerous cases of leptospirosis. And I think would have understood also most of the things. The genus is Leptospira. The species, what we actually commonly see is interrogans. Leptospirus interrogans is what we actually see. Now, there are so many other names also. We also call it as Wheels disease. It's not just the hepatorenal component. The disease per se can be called Wheels. There's nothing wrong in that. It's also called Rice Field Fever. It's another term that we use. Okay, and Japanese called the Nanukayami Fever, etc. So there are so many other terms as well. So Leptospira Interagents is what we're going to talk about. Now, prima facie, the reservoir is going to be your rodent and it's going to be excreting this in its urine as well as in its stool. Prima facie in its urine and it's going to be contaminating the water and you know that you can actually get it. Whether you get it with an intact skin is a matter of controversy. Most of the people see, think that you don't get it with an intact skin. You need an abrasion on your skin or it has to enter through the mucosa for you to actually get the disease. And you find out the organism. This is the the coiled nature of the organism, as you can actually see, pretty much a coiled nature of the organism. How do we actually approach this disease? So the incubation period for leptospirosis on an average is around 10 days. So 10 days is the incubation period. Now the disease is going to start. The disease here again is going to start with fever. Okay, the disease again here is going to start with fever. Now we saw dengue starting with fever. We saw typhoid starting with fever. I discussed the differences. When you look at leptospirosis starting off with fever, I would probably think that this is an abrupt onset fever. But is it fever that the patient first experiences? No. It is always myalgia that the patient experiences. It is a myalgia that is disproportionate to the fever. It's as if your muscles are breaking down. Okay. So that, although we call dengue as break bone fever, more than I think this is more appropriate to call depto as a muscle breaking down kind of a fever. So you have severe myalgia. And majority of patients have conjunctival suffusion. So we probably tend to think of myalgia plus conjunctival suffusion plus fever as the most, most important part. Okay. And then by day four or five, you start to see that many of these patients have got cough. Many of these patients start to have some degree of abdominal distension. Also, it's not very 100% classical, but this is generally the pattern that you see. The patient generally tends to do well because by day four, most of the time we are starting this patient on doxycycline. And doxycycline is a drug that tends to fare very well against leptospirosis. If you start doxycycline, then that's pretty much good. Serology-wise, it's very difficult because none of the tests have been found to be very useful except for this IgM lepto, which takes more than 7 to 8 days to become positive. So inside that time period, I've already made a diagnosis. It would have already started treating the patient. The problem with leptospirosis is, again, that at the end of week 1, okay, end of week 1, there are two possibilities. One is a completely clinical road to recovery where nothing else happens, okay. In few patients, they can actually go into complications. So the end of week one, especially when the fever has come down, that is when complications can start. And most of these complications have got an immunological basis rather than the organism per se. It has got an immunological basis. And this is these complications that you have to be very, very careful with respect to leptospirosis. Complication number one that leptospirosis patients can develop is renal failure. And renal failure in a leptospirosis patient is a proper acute tubulo interstitial nephritis. We never talked about acute tubulo interstitial nephritis in dengue. We didn't talk about it in typhoid. But in lepto, we are actually going to talk about it. And because this organism actually inhibits the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter at the level of the thickening limb of lupofenly, most of our patients with lepto tend to have hypokalemia. They also tend to have hyponatremia. So, AKI patient who is a non-oliguric AKI patient having hypokalemia and hyponatremia in a tropical setting, the first thing that has to come to your mind is leptospirosis. There is absolutely no doubt about it. And many patients have an immunological destruction of platelets. So, thrombocytopenia also goes hand in hand. So, thrombocytopenia goes hand in hand. Majority of these patients will have some degree of hepatitis. That's why transaminitis with jaundice is also seen. Transmenitis with jaundice is also seen. 
this is one way of looking at it okay second is a patient who can have severe rhabdomyolysis so this is the other complication that you can expect severe rhabdomyolysis and rhabdomyolysis also per se can lead on to acute kidney injury okay though not very common many patients have developed myocarditis so any leptospirosis patient who is actually having chest pain a patient having refractory hypotension okay a patient having unexplained tachycardia a patient having new onset ecg changes always think of this okay for pulmonary hemorrhage so not very common these days but again when a leptospirosis patient has respiratory distress always look for pulmonary hemorrhage and hemosiderin laden macrophages in sputum okay hemosiderin laden macrophages in sputum correct then of course the tendency to go into ards so although we studied salmonella and dengue we never said of any of these complications lepto week 2 is a very crucial time wherein the patient can actually recover just like that or go into all these complications and atn many times requires dialysis and many times patient comes out of it also the general prognosis is good but we again had cases where patients have done very badly and i remember a patient who was being treated for leptospirosis aki she was faring better she was coming out of it she was coming out to creatinine 1.2 1.3 we had stopped dialysis and we were planning discharge suddenly she developed an acute pulmonary edema acute pulmonary edema presentation out of nowhere did an echo that time we gave lasix and tidied over we did an echo echo was again showing acute mr lepto was actually showing acute mr and acute mr was because of caudal rupture so we saw caudal rupture in leptospirosis so all kinds of complications but all this pretty much during the second week okay so that's why it's very very important to figure out lepto and start treating in the first week itself because then we can actually reduce the chances although i said it is in immunological basis it has been proven that effective treatment of the organism in the first week has reduced the risk of complications okay so conjunctival sufficient is something that you have to always always keep in mind so ip average 10 days abrupt onset of fever with headache and myalgia conjunctival sufficient i would say headache more is always in favor of dengue myalgia more is always in favor of lepto renal atin as well as rhabdomyolysis pulmonary hemorrhage myocarditis rhabdomyolysis thrombocytopenia with hypokalemia hyponatremia aseptic meningitis this is something i wanted to actually give you an idea on so in the first week of illness in salmonella there is no way that you can develop meningitis not even in the second week third week you develop typhoid related brain disease which is delirium and altered sensorium and those things dengue producing meningitis again very very very, very uncommon but a disease which can just like that complicate into meningitis there are two diseases which can just like that complicate into meningitis and that is generally again at the end of week 1 those are lepto and scrub typhus so please keep in mind aseptic meningitis is also a very much complication in this disease okay now how do you diagnose now diagnosis has so many criteria fein is the first person who actually put the criteria this is the criteria that we follow in india this is by our own dr shivakumar sir he's a legendary person in leptospirosis please read on his contributions very fortunate to have met him very fortunate to have talked to him very fortunate to have actually been part of many things very very uh, what is a useful criteria you can actually see this part a part b epidemiological data part c bacterial lab findings you don't have to know this but it's just out of my emotional connect with the disease and emotional connect with sir that i've actually posted this but this is very useful when you do it in a hospital setting now the bacteriological lab findings actually tell us one very important point that serological tests are not much value the best test that you have is called the microscopic agglutination test or the mat test which for your exam asked is the gold standard okay it is got only research value that's a problem so we are not using math and even if you use math it doesn't have much of a value it's a very complex time consuming cumbersome process so we're not using this the only thing that we can use is your igm elisa and igm elisa is generally positive after 7 days so igm elisa is positive after 7 days single titer high of math if you can do it in centers like in chennai is definitely of value but in a common setting when you treat a patient igm elisa positivity is more than more than more than Okay, and let's see what the symptoms sir has actually given points. Sir has given points for myalgia that is four points, conjunctival suffusion four points, meningism four points, which I said aseptic meningitis meningism is given four points, and fever he has actually given only two points, which means that here it is myalgia that is most most striking. Okay, how do you manage a patient with lepto? How do you manage a patient with lepto? um managing a patient with lepto is bread butter and jam day 4 if you start cortrimoxazol i mean cortrimoxazol doesn't generally have any kind of an activity against lepto so day 4 you have to be starting the patient on doxycycline so for a mild case of lepto doxycycline or azithromycin 
for 7 to 10 days is as per the textbook enough but I'm not quite sure of that because even if you say 100 mg BD doxycycline or 500 mg OD acetromycin is enough how much does it prevent complications in the second week after fever comes down is a debatable thing. So if you clinically feel that it is lepto, if you clinically have a high suspicion of lepto, you having started oxy is perfect. But it's always better that you give the patient a shot of penicillin. 1.5 million units Q6H, not a shot, so many shots. Or ceftriaxon, 2 gram IVOD. Okay, so ceftriaxone, 2 gram IVOD, and this has to be given for 7 to 10 days. This has to be given for 7 to 10 days. So, uh, as per the textbook, mild cases require only doxy. Moderate and severe cases require this, but there is no classification as to who is mild, moderate, and severe. Let us take it in a very simple way. Fourth day of fever, if you're not clear, we start the patient on doxy. If you feel that this is likely to be lepto, taking into consideration the tropical nature, taking into consideration the job of the patient, taking into consideration the presence of myalgia, conjunctival suffusion, rhabdomyolysis, and stuff, you can always start the patient on pencil and all septics.